morning. The uh, scripture reading for this morning, the passage we're going to be looking at today comes from Psalm 75. Psalm 75, verses 1 through 10. Please uh, listen and hear and worship God as I read his word. We give thanks to you, O God, we give thanks, for your name is near. Men declare your wondrous works. When I select an appointed time, it is I who judge with equity. The earth and all who dwell in it melt. It is I who firmly set its pillars. Selah. I said to the boastful, do not boast. And to the wicked, do not lift up the horn, and do not lift up your horn on high. Do not speak with insolent pride. For not from the east, nor from the west, nor from the desert comes exaltation, but God is the judge. He puts down one and exalts another. For a cup is in the hand of the Lord, and the wine foams. It is well mixed, and he pours out of this. Surely all the wicked of the earth must drain and drink down its dregs. But as for me, I will declare it forever. I will sing praises to the God of Jacob. And all the horns of the wicked he will cut off, but the horns of the righteous will be lifted up. This is the word of the Lord for us this morning. May he add his blessing to its reading and its preaching today. You may be seated. Well, as you can tell, we're not in the Gospel of John today. Um, I've heard from a number of you how troubled you are about uh, events relating to the state of Minnesota that have uh, unfolded this past week. I felt the need this morning to take a break from the Gospel of John in light of that. And um, last week, if you don't know what I'm talking about, last week the state of Minnesota enshrined in law an unrestricted, quote-unquote, right to abortion um, up to the point of birth. So it it is unrestricted. It's called the PRO Act, the Protect Reproductive Options Act. What this act did, uh, in the words of our governor, what this act did was to put up a firewall against the efforts to reverse reproductive freedom. So in other words, it's an effort to make sure that this supposed right can never be challenged or threatened in the state of Minnesota. The uh, guarantee for an abortion was already uh, confirmed prior to this act being signed into law. This act was an added measure to try and make sure that abortion is never stripped away from the state of Minnesota as a legal practice. Sinning with a high hand is what it is. Now, I know that I'm preaching to the choir today here at Oak Ridge Community Church. We're not out on the steps at the Capitol at a pro-abortion rally or an anti-abortion rally, for that matter. But I do feel that it's my duty to speak Christ's truth to issues that are current. Um, And uh, the, the aim there is to help us think about how we should respond to these kinds of issues that we're facing in our own day. This law was not surprising to any of us who have paid attention to the trajectory of the Democrat Party, Democratic Party. They've been uh, moving this direction for a long time. But it is still deeply troubling. And I personally have been grieving over what it signals to us about our state and the societal context where Christ has planted us and called us to be salt and light. 
I'm struggling not to feel despair over the future, over our future in this state. And I'm talking about our future as Oak Ridge Community Church. I'm struggling not to feel despair about our future in this state. In light of the fact that our lawmakers and government officials cannot see the evil in what they have done. How can you trust a government to uphold true justice when the murder of an innocent child is declared to be justice? If they won't protect, you need to get this, and you need to understand this reality about the government that is over you right now. If this government will not take measures to protect the most innocent, helpless, needy, dependent lives among us, do not think for a second that this government will take measures to protect your life. It will not happen. If you think that the government cares a lick about you and your well-being, you are deceived. Our current government, anyway. You know, the Declaration of Independence speaks to what ought to be done with a government like this government. I think everyone should go read that document again. To be honest, what's been floating in my heart and mind, really, I, I've, I've wavered back and forth this week on whether or not to, to come to deal with this topic today. I, I actually worked on my sermon in John all the way up through Thursday evening. And Friday morning, I woke up at 4 o'clock with a burden. And the, the sermon just unfolded itself in my mind as soon as I woke up. And I, I typed it out, started working on it. It was done by Friday at 2. And so forgive any uh, shortcomings in it. Amen, brother. Thank you, Eger. Yeah. You're a gracious brother. Yeah. Yeah. Blessed are the merciful. Amen. To be honest, the words that have been swirling around in my heart are the words of Psalm 74, 10 through 11. And, uh, specifically in Hebrew, it's very, very powerful. Av Mathai Elohim Yaharef Tsar. How long, O oh God, will the foe continue taunting? And the enemy revile your name with success. That's my own translation. How long, O oh Lord, will the, will the enemy, will the foe continue taunting? And the enemy revile your name with success. How long will you let this keep going on, Lord? When are you going to stop withdrawing your hand, O oh Lord? Lord, from your bosom, strike out against them and destroy them. The burden of Asaph has been very much on my heart this week. We hear that same cry from the, unless you think this is some undignified, unsanctified desire of some sinner in the world, listen to the cry of the saints who are in glory taking refuge under the altar of God. This is reminiscent of Revelation 6.10. Those who have been trampled by the evil in this world and are now taking refuge with God under His holy altar in heaven, they continue crying out to the Lord saying, How long, how long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood? How long must we wait until you avenge our blood upon those who dwell on the earth? How long are you going to let this keep happening? Judge them, Lord. Avenge us. That sounds harsh to our modern ears, which have been desensitized to the cry of true justice. But it's important to recognize that those desires, both in Asaph and in these saints in heaven, those desires for God to deal out justice were produced in their hearts by the Holy Spirit himself. Well, with that in mind, um, with that question in mind, how long, Lord, will the foe continue taunting you? 
How long will he revile your name with success? With that question in mind, I thought it would be helpful to turn to Psalm 75 this morning. Because that question in Psalm 74 remains unanswered in Psalm 74. Psalm of Asaph. God's answer to that question is given to us in Psalm 75. You ought to read these psalms together. Both of them are psalms of Asaph. One is his prayer. The other is God's answer. In Psalm 75, God gives the answer to that question of how long. And it provides, God provides for us in this psalm what he wants his people to focus on as we struggle to live in a world where ungodliness seems not only to be increasing, but where it appears to prosper. It holds both a warning for the world and every sinner in the world, but it also offers comfort and hope to the people of God. And so what I want to look at today, you, you have in your bulletins, I believe, thanks to uh, the sacrificial service of Lauren, who, because I could not decide on this earlier on in the week, uh, these were not in the bulletins until this morning when Lauren filled them. So thank you, brother. What I want to do, I, what I basically did is I took the outline from the kids' bulletin and made another outline for you guys to have, all right? So it's fill in the blank because it's for the kids, all right? But uh, maybe it'll be helpful for you. What I want to do is walk through basically three different points this morning. One is I want to look at three principles of comfort for God's people that are found here in Psalm 75. Secondly, I want to pronounce from God's word three indictments against the state of Minnesota. And then finally, I want to end on three ways that God's people should respond. Okay? So three principles of comfort, three indictments, three ways to respond. Before we get to that, would you please pray with me? Father, we do thank you for your grace and your mercy that has plucked us as brands from the fire. We, we do not stand here or gather here in this room with any sense of being better or greater than those who are committing these abominations around us. God, we, we are not the Pharisee thanking you that we are not like these sinners. Lord, we who know our hearts, we know, we know the sinners that we are. And we know what you have saved us from, at least in some partial but true manner. We know what you have saved us from. We have true knowledge of your grace, Lord. And I, I pray that this morning you would help us talk through this issue in a way that's helpful. And uh, settle our hearts, quiet our minds, help us think and focus uh, uh, directly upon what you have to say to us from your word. We pray this in Jesus' name, Father. Amen. All right, so three principles of comfort for God's people. Number one, from Psalm 75, number one, we need to comfort our hearts during evil times with the fact that God will always preserve a remnant of faithful worshipers in this world. God will always preserve a remnant of faithful worshipers in this world. Verse 1 of Psalm 75 opens with Asaph declaring, We give thanks to you, O God. We give thanks for your name is near and men declare your wondrous deeds. That is, we give thanks to you, O God, because you have made yourself known to us and men have responded to that revelation in true worship. God's name, that, that refers to God's nature, the revelation of who God is. And as this psalm begins, what we find is the Holy Spirit ministering to Asaph's heart by reminding him that in the midst of this ungodly world where there is all this struggle against evil and, and depravity, there is still a remnant who gives thanks to God for who he is. There is still a remnant who relished the reality that God has caused his name to draw near to them and then respond in that in worship by praising him and declaring his wondrous deeds. 
Asaph is thanking God for bringing about a people who continue to proclaim and declare God's mighty and wondrous deeds in the midst of a godless world. And beloved, we should also give thanks to God for that great work of his grace in saving a people to be his own personal possession. Right here, we find our first instruction for how God wants you and me to respond to evil in, the, in this uh, stain of evil world, in this stained world that covered our state last week. The stain of evil that covered our state last week. Despite what evil and wicked people have done and are doing in this world, God still has made himself known to us. He has not, in other words, he has not withdrawn the knowledge of himself in reaction to our ungodliness. He has only pressed it in upon us further. That's gracious. We're not wandering around in this present darkness without hope or without light. The light of truth has broken in upon a world of lies and darkness. And by God's grace, our Lord Jesus Christ has implanted that revelation of God's light within us. We are among those who have been awakened to see the truth about who God is and to respond in worship. This is the work of the Holy Spirit in divine illumination, stamping the indelible mark of God's light and holiness upon our souls. As we think about how to respond to our state government's actions this past week and the celebration of infant murder by the deceived masses, we must comfort ourselves with the fact that at any and every moment in world history, including right at this moment in Minnesota's history, there has been and there always will be a remnant of humanity who by God's grace know and worship him in spirit and in truth. Even in this current darkness, beloved, we must praise God for that grace. Not all of us are left in our deception and we should give thanks to God for that. Because that proves that even when the ugliest forms of human depravity manifest themselves all around us, even then and at that moment, God is accomplishing his work of redemption. His hand is not stayed. He will leave a faithful remnant who not only see his glory for themselves, but who will then continue to declare his glory and his wondrous deeds as a testimony against the evil deeds of the world around them. So we should give thanks that he will always preserve a remnant of people. Secondly, God wants us to keep in mind that he has appointed a time for judgment. We should give thanks that he preserves a remnant in the midst of this godless world. But we should also give thanks to God and comfort our souls with the fact that God has an appointed time for judgment. Verses 2 through 3, the Lord says, When I select an appointed time, it is I who judge with equity. Asaph, I've heard your complaint. Saints, under the altar, I hear you and I know. But at the right time, I will move in judgment. And I will take care of this. Now that judging with equity, that's not the... Equity, diversity, inclusion, that, it's not that kind of equity that you're force-fed every day at work. No, biblical equity is the guarantee of equal treatment before God's law. So it's not equality of outcomes. That's, that's not true equity. That's not real equality. Equality of outcomes is not real equality. That's a lie of critical theory. It's not equality of outcomes. It is equality of treatment before God's holy throne. So God shows no partiality, and he will judiciously and fairly adjudicate on behalf of every single person. He will judge justly. He will judge with equity. And notice what God promises about when that time arrives. He says, the, when, when that appointed moment of judgment comes, the earth and all who dwell in it will melt. Uh, you hear it described in other prophets as a wax, a, a form of wax before a furnace. It just, it just dissipates. It just melts down. It cannot stand in the presence of the heat. 
So it will be for the ungodly of this world. They will utterly melt before the presence of a holy God. No matter how hard and brazen a sinner may appear to be on the outside right now, no matter how much defiance Governor Walls has in raising his hands and applauding this, this great declaration of murdering children, we're so happy. No matter how brazen and hard-hearted he is in this moment, on that day he will melt before the holy presence of God. On that day of holy judgment, all obstinance and all defiance and all rebellion against God's holy will will dissolve. In God as the creator and the sustainer of the world, the one who established its pillars, he says in verse 3. That God will make sure that there is not remaining a single place for one single sinner to hide from his judgment seat. The earth and all who dwell in it will melt. Now, as odd as this may seem to us in our effeminate and dis desensitized age, God wants all of his people to be comforted by the fact that he will execute perfect justice on every person who does wickedness. You know, a lot of us struggle with that because we don't experience directly the, the depravity of man in pouring out their vileness upon us. My grandma, who suffered much at the hands of godless men, I got her Bible I received her Bible after she passed away in every single passage talking about the judgment seat of God and the fact that God will judge with righteousness. She had that boxed and starred and highlighted. Her hope was in the reality that one day God's going to make every wrong right and he will vindicate her one day. And the same is true for us as we face an issue as evil as the PRO Act here in the state of Minnesota. We ought to comfort ourselves with the fact that God will not let this stand. 2 Peter 2, 7 through 8, it gives us the same comfort to Christians. Peter says, for everyone who, like righteous Lot, has their righteous soul tormented day after day by the lawless deeds of the society around us, God gives us this assurance in verses 9 through 10 that he knows how to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the judgment of the great day. God is speaking that through Peter to comfort his suffering people who are afflicted by, tormented by the lawless deeds around them. He knows how to keep the unrighteous under punishment, and he will do it. Or Ezekiel chapter 9, verse 4. You may remember this well. For those who sigh and groan over the abominations which are being committed in our midst, God wants us to find comfort in the fact that he not only takes notice of our groanings, he not only recognizes that we in our groaning are manifesting uh, desires that are, that are after the very desires of God's own heart. We are grieving with God's grief as we behold the abominations around us. God wants us to be comforted by the fact that he knows and he sees us as we moan and groan over the evil that's being done around us. But he also wants us to be comforted by this fact. That he not only knows that we are groaning with him, but he also has promised that the day will come when he himself will deal with those who commit these abominations. Verse 10. That day will come when his eye will have no pity and will not spare. And he will bring their conduct upon their own heads. God wants his people who mourn over the abominations being done around them to take comfort in that reality. The day's coming when God will show the wicked no pity and no mercy. God has appointed a time when he will destroy his enemies, and we can count on that, and we can take comfort in that. In evil times like our own, we must comfort ourselves with that reality because Let's face it, it is so easy to grow disillusioned and, and become despairing in times like the times in which we're living. Where we, we almost lose hope and we lose any sense of, of um, being able to affect change and in interacting with our society around us. God doesn't want us to be like that. He wants us to comfort our hearts in the reality that one day he's going to deal with it all. 
We need to keep plodding forward in hope, one step at a time. With our hands to the plow, just focused on one thing. We're just trying to make a straight row. Right? That leads us to the third comfort that we find in this passage. I'll try and be briefer on this, but it deserves fuller treatment. All of these do. Thirdly, we must be comforted or comfort ourselves with the fact that even in the midst of wrath, God continues extending the promise of his mercy. Even though God has decreed an appointed time for judgment, until that time comes, he does not stop calling sinners to repentance. That's the very, those are the very next verses, verses 4 and 5 in Psalm 75. God says, I said to the boastful, do not boast. I said to the wicked, do not lift up the horn. Do not lift up your horn on high and do not speak with insolent pride. Now don't miss this. Right in between God's promise of wrath and judgment in verses 2 and 3, and then God's description of that wrath and judgment in verses 6 through 8, you have God pleading with this promise of mercy to the wicked of the world. It's like Jonah. When Jonah came to Nineveh preaching the judgment of God that was going to come upon Nineveh, Jonah did not preach anything about an offer of forgiveness he didn't say anything about mercy. He simply said, 40 days and Nineveh is going to be destroyed. And God even used that to call Nineveh to repentance. It's that same flavor here. Where God, though there's no stated promise of forgiveness, the very fact that God is calling upon the wicked to stop being wicked is an expression of his mercy. If God had no desire whatsoever to be merciful to the wicked of this world, he would not call them away from their wickedness. He would not tell them to stop being evil. He would not call them to turn from their sin. He would simply let them go. That is the greatest expression of God's judgment upon someone. He lets that person go. Now, God's plea in verses 4 through 5 is made more forceful by the description of judgment that is to come in verses 6 through 8. There's no hope of finding deliverance in anyone other than God. That's what verse 6 is getting at. When it says, you can look to the east and you can look to the west, you can look to the mountainous desert and you can cry out for help all you want, but the reality is there's only one who lifts up and there's only one who puts down and that is God the judge. God is the judge over all the earth. And as judge, he is preparing his sentence upon those who, who do wickedness in his world. Verse 8, it describes it as a, a cup of righteous judgment swirling in the hands of Yahweh. He's keeping it well mixed and foamed. It, it, it's, it's prepared and ready and God is making sure that it's ready at any moment to pour it out upon the ungodly. That's that picture. He's sitting there, he's swirling that cup and keeping it well mixed. Surely, God says at the end of verse 8, all the wicked of the earth must drain and drink down its dregs. They must drain the demands of God's justice down to its bitter end, which, as we know from other parts of Scripture, has no end apart from being in Christ. And yet, even in that moment, up until the moment when the cup of his wrath is placed to the lips of the wicked, we find God pleading for them to turn. So long as there is breath, this is what we need to take comfort in. So long as there is breath in a sinner's lungs, there is hope for that sinner to be saved. So long as God sustains his or her life, he continues to plead with that person to repent. With every breath that that person breathes, with every piece of food that that person enjoys, with, with every moment of God's common grace poured out upon that person, God is calling that sinner to turn to him, to see his goodness, to welcome the compassion of the God who is true, to come and receive mercy from his hand. 
can almost hear the Lord pleading with every, with every expression of his common grace to, to the world of sinners. You can hear God pleading with them, why? Why will you choose to die? I take no pleasure in your death. You're not being hindered by me from being saved. You're being hindered by yourself. You can just hear the Lord screaming the words of Ezekiel 18 out to the world of the ungodly. You know, Spurgeon once said that until the, gates, until the gate of hell is shut upon a man, we must not cease to pray for him. And if we see him hugging the very doorpost of damnation, we must go to the mercy seat and beseech the arm of grace to pluck him from that dangerous position. While there is life, Spurgeon said, there's hope. So long as the sinner is still alive, there is an opportunity for that sinner to repent. That should give us hope as we think about the state of Minnesota. God has not yet wiped this state off the map. And there is still hope. So don't despair, beloved. Be comforted. God will always maintain a remnant of worshipers, no no matter how dark it gets. He's appointed a day of judgment when he will deal with every single evil act that's ever been done. And until that day comes, knowing the fullness of their end, God continues pleading for them to repent. And we must do the same. So those are the three points of comfort. Now in light of that, I want to lay out three clear indictments that God's word sets against the state of Minnesota relating to the issue of abortion. Three clear indictments against the state of Minnesota relating to the issue of abortion. And I will maintain these statements and these indictments until the very judgment seat of God. What I want to lay out are three proofs that what the state of Minnesota has done is evil in the eyes of God and deserves and will be condemned. Deserves to be and will be condemned. In many ways, these indictments could be applied to other places and other people in this nation as well. But because we live in Minnesota, because we fellowship in Minnesota, because we interact with people in Minnesota, it seems appropriate only to speak about the situation in Minnesota. In Psalm 74, verses 4 through 5, the same warning that God speaks to the wicked, calling them to turn from their wickedness. He says, do not boast. And to the wicked, do not lift up your horn on high. Do not speak with insolent pride. Those same words that he speaks to a wicked world, he speaks to the wicked people of Minnesota. Now, if anything happened this last week, our state legislative body lifted up its horn in defiance of God's holy law, and even in defiance of common sense. The PRO Act, the Protect Reproductive Options Act, claims to establish that, quote, every individual has a fundamental right to make autonomous decisions about the individual's own reproductive health, including abortion, contraception, and sterilization. Early last Saturday morning, the bill passed in the Senate by a vote of 34 to 33 after 35 attempts by Republicans to amend the bill. According to State Senator Julia Coleman, Minnesota Democrats shot down amendments that would in any way put restrictions on what could be done under the umbrella term of abortion. So, for example, they refused even to consider proposed amendments like prohibiting a woman from getting an abortion while she is in labor, requiring a baby who survived abortion to be anesthetized and treated with medical treatment prior to passing away. State Senator Coleman even stated that the law would strip away parental rights, making provision for minors to receive abortions as well as sterilization without requiring parental consent or even parental notification. 
And on Tuesday, January 3rd, our governor, Governor Walls, affixed his signature to the act. Sarah Traxler, the chief medical officer at Planned Parenthood, North Central States, claims that, quote, the PRO Act solidifies Minnesotans' fundamental human rights into state law and acts as an insurance policy that our rights won't be taken away by politicians or judges, end quote. Now let's at least be honest with what this is really all about. This is an attempt to enshrine into law a claimed fundamental right to murder innocent, helpless, defenseless children in their mother's womb. Let's just be real about that. And let's not be ashamed to declare that that is the reality that abortion is dealing with out in the world. Let's not be ashamed to declare that out in the world. As I'm going to prove to you in a moment, we all know what's going on when an abortion is taking place. The fact that something as atrocious as this could be signed into law and celebrated by our legislators as a victory for women is the greatest evidence proving the fact that the state of Minnesota is under the wrath of God and is being prepared for destruction. Romans chapter 1, verse 25, the greatest act of judgment that God can pour out upon a people is the judgment of handing them over to satisfy the sinful and evil lust that their hearts crave. That is what happens when God allows a people to fill up the measure of their sins. He simply hands them over to glut themselves on their own evil depravity. To grow fat on their sin the way that cattle are fattened up for the day of slaughter. The wrath of God is manifest most when he allows ignorant human beings to be the masters of their own fate and captains of their own soul. Now upon what basis is the state of Minnesota condemned before God? Upon what basis do I offer indictments against the state of Minnesota? Well, number one, first indictment. Every baby conceived in the womb is God's creation. No matter how that baby came to be. God is the author of life. If life is present, God brought that life about. No matter how that life, no matter the circumstances by which that life came to be. Psalm 139, verse 13, it says, You formed my inward parts. You wove me together in my mother's womb. Now I want you to notice what David does not say there. He does not say, you wove my body together and prepared it for me in my mother's womb. He says, you wove me together in my mother's womb. You were so intimately involved in my development in my mother's womb that you were weaving together my inward parts. No matter the circumstances, a baby that was brought into existence in this world, a baby that has been conceived has been brought into existence by the creative power of God, and he is intimately involved in knitting that child together, even in the womb. So if there is life in the womb, it is because the God of life is at work in that womb. How dare we presume upon ourselves the right to enter in and destroy the work that God himself is fashioning? That's indictment number one. You've transgressed the boundaries, the proper boundaries of your created, your creature limitations. And God will have his vengeance on you for destroying the work of his hands. Number two, protecting every baby is God's command. Protecting the life of every baby, even in the womb, is God's command. Exodus chapter 21, verses 22 through 25. God's holy law sets down a standard that must be upheld in relation to a baby that is still in the womb of its mother. Verse 22, if men struggle with each other and strike a woman with child so that she gives birth prematurely, yet there is no injury, 
He shall surely be fined as the woman's husband may demand him, and he shall pay as the judges decide. So there's a penalty to be paid for causing a woman to go into labor early, even if there's no harm to the baby. Okay, that's how much God values the safety of that child in its mother's womb. You will be punished for causing that child to go into labor or bringing that child out prematurely, even if there's no damage. Verse 23 but if there is any further injury, then you shall appoint as a penalty life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, bruise for bruise. God's law demands that every baby must be protected even while that baby is in the womb, so much so that even when two men accidentally hit a woman and caused the baby to be born prematurely, the one who actually hit the woman would be held accountable to any damage that was done to the child due to his recklessness. Now note the standard. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, wound for wound, and what? Life for life. If a man struck the child while it was in its mother's womb and that child died, then according to God's justice, the man who hit her must be put to death. That's how much God values the life that is still in the womb of the mother. Now, if that's the penalty for those who accidentally strike and kill a baby in its mother's womb, how much worse is the penalty in God's eyes, or how much worse is the offense in God's eyes for those who do this on purpose? Now, to be clear, listen, to be clear, abortion is not permitted because we are ignorant about what is going on. We are not committing abortions and calling abortions good because of our ignorance about what's happening when abortions take place. Everyone knows exactly what is being done in an abortion. And in 1976, we find one of the clearest illustrations of that reality. In a book published by Magna, uh, Magda Deans, or Denise. Mag, Magda Deans, man, stumbling over that name. She's German, I think. She survived the Holocaust. And wrote a book walking through a New York City abortion clinic. Uh, she, she walked through it to see what she could learn from what was happening in this New York City abortion clinic. And she published her findings in this book called In Necessity and Sorrow. Now, amazingly, she was pro-abortion. But this book is one of the greatest works that would convince anyone to reject that position that I've ever seen. All right. Magda Deans wrote this book, In Necessity and Sorrow, and one of the most indicting statements against the whole abortion movement is contained in that book. While visiting an abortion city or center in New York City and looking upon the aftermath of an abortion, she writes the following. I look inside the bucket in front of me. There's a small naked person in there floating in a bloody liquid, plainly the tragic victim of a drowning accident. But then perhaps this was no accident because the body is purple with bruises. Magda even reports one abortionist saying the following, that while administering the drug that would kill the baby in the womb, quote, you can feel the fetus wiggling at the end of that needle and moving around, which is an unpleasant thing, end quote. Well, let me be clear. The reason why you can feel that fetus wiggling around at the end of that needle is because it is a living baby. No, it is not able to discern fully what is happening around it, but there is at least enough consciousness and awareness to know when something is being poked into its body. It responds. It can interact with its environment. It recognizes when something hurts it. I remember my son, you guys know my son passed away after two days? They said he was brain dead. He couldn't feel anything. Absolutely not true. 
Because the very first thing they did whenever they brought him out from Jamie's womb, they brought him into the NICU. I was in there and I watched the whole thing. They went to put a needle in his hand. And guess what he did whenever they put the needle into his hand? He jerked it away. And I said, that's my boy. <laughs> don't, tell, don't, even, don't even begin to make an argument that this thing in the womb is something that's not living. When you can poke a needle into it and feel it wiggling around on the other side, that is a testimony to the reality that it's alive. I cannot imagine, I can't imagine how seared your conscience has to be to force yourself to go through with something like that. And then not only to do it once, but to, but to go over against this, this blatant reality, this manifest truth that this thing I'm sticking this needle in is a living creature. To suppress that reality and then to subdue your conscience enough to be able to push the plunger through. Man, how seared must your conscience be to force yourself to do something like that? Oh, but this is, this is all a political game. This is about stripping women away from their rights. No. No, it's about saving and protecting the life, the innocent life that's in that womb. She doesn't have to keep the baby. But for God's sake, don't kill it. Like John the Baptist in Luke chapter 1, verse 44, he he leapt in his mother's womb when the voice of Mary entered into the room. Babies don't have the ability to process everything that's going on, but they still have enough awareness to respond to what's going on around them. So after administering that poison to the baby, the baby would die slowly, and then the mother would have to deliver that baby's dead body. But that was the 70s. <sighs> Nowadays, we have more safe and effective methods of getting rid of that unpleasant, inconvenient consequence of our unrestrained sexual lust. We tout ourselves as being far more humane than we used to be. We no longer force abortionists to be exposed to such an intimate realization that the living thing on the other end of that needle is alive. We no longer subject mothers to the traumatizing experience of delivering the body of the baby she just conspired with the doctors to murder. And she is guilty of that. No, now, nowadays, if we don't first poison that child to death with a pill, we deal with it, we deal with that little parasite through what is called d and &E, dilation and evacuation. This is a procedure in which the abortionist dilates the cervix, dilation, and then surgically clears the contents of the uterus, evacuation. Now, it's my understanding that surgically clearing the contents means taking forceps and ripping the body of the baby out piece by piece until all of it is extracted. Far more humane, right? I mean, at least at that point, the mother doesn't even have to look at the horrific consequences of her precious autonomy. And the doctor no longer has to feel the thing moving around on the other side of the needle. But in that book, Magda says that the most troubling part of that job for the nurses was injecting that needle and administering the poison. Everyone, my point in bringing this up is simply to make the argument that everyone involved in the process of aborting a child, of murdering a child, knows that this is not about reproductive rights. This is about murder, which leads to a third principle, a third indictment. 
God promises to avenge, number three, God promises to avenge every child murdered in the womb. God will not let this issue slide. As much as the consciousness of the modern American can't even recall major events that happened last week, let alone six months ago or a year ago, God will not forget. What God said to the Ammonites in Amos chapter 1 verse 13, he says to every abortionist today, thus says the Lord, Amos 1 13, Thus says the Lord, Yahweh, for three transgressions of the sons of Ammon and for four, I will not revoke its punishment because they ripped open the pregnant women of Gilead to enlarge their borders. Bring it in our context. They ripped open the pregnant women of Gilead for the sake of gain, comfort, ease. How depraved must our society be when for the sake of enlarging our own borders, our own personal gain, our women willingly offer their wombs to be ripped open? Every culture in the world, uh, in, in total, at least as a whole, has recognized the evil of ripping a woman's womb open and ripping that baby out and killing it. Every culture in, the, in human history has recognized that that is not a good thing to do to your own people. And yet we in our day call it good when a woman willfully submits to it. If God brought vengeance upon those who did such unspeakable atrocities to the unwilling how much more will he bring vengeance upon those who do it willingly? Upon all parties that are complicit. My friends, my brothers and sisters, I do not have to be a prophet, nor do I have to be the son of a prophet to declare definitively that God is coming in wrath upon the state of Minnesota. Psalm 75, we know that even now God is swirling his cup of wrath around and he is preparing to pour it out upon the state of Minnesota down to its dregs. God will not be mocked. We will reap what we sow. We've sown the wind, we're going to reap the whirlwind. We've sown rebellion, we're going to reap destruction. And, And sadly enough, very often it's the next generation that has to experience the full weight of that destructive force. But every single person complicit in the murder of a child will be made to drink from the cup of God's wrath. From doctors to lawyers to judges to Minnesota state senators and representatives, even down to the fathers who fail to be real men and rise up to protect their own children. Jesus says in Revelation 21.8 that cowards will be in hell. Those who didn't have the moral fortitude or backbone to stand and do what was right, cowards will be in hell. And God's God's cup of wrath will also be placed upon those hardened lips of mothers who have lost all of their motherly compassion and have abandoned their babies to the butcher. God has an appointed time for each and every one of them to drink down the wrath of his cup. It is well mixed, meaning it will be meted out in perfect exact measurement. And it remains ready to be poured out at any moment. And and notice, judgment will be perfect. It will be life for life. It will be eye for eye. It will be tooth for tooth. It will be hand for hand. It will be foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, bruise for bruise. God's judgment upon the ungodly will be exact and meted out exactly. All right, so three ways we should respond. Try and be somewhat quick here. Number one, we respond rightly to 
to the evil in our times. We respond the way God wants us and calls us to respond. When we, de- when we continue declaring the truth of God's will and wondrous deeds unashamedly. Psalm 75, 9, Asaph says, after this um, unfolding of the reality of judgment upon the wicked, Asaph says, I will declare it forever. Declare what? What will he declare forever? Well, he will declare the righteous judgment of God. He will declare the destruction of the wicked and the exaltation of the righteous. Don't succumb, please, beloved friends, listen, please. Don't succumb to the pressure of the society around us. Don't feel yourself forced to sit silently by while neighbors and friends and family members can continue to celebrate the murder of babies. Don't be ashamed to speak God's word and God's truth on this matter. Because one day, the day when it really counts, the fact that you weren't ashamed to speak the truth of Christ to an ungodly world will be in your favor. Mark chapter 8, verse 38, Jesus said that if we are ashamed in this adulterous and sinful generation to speak his words, then he will be ashamed of us on the day of judgment and before God and his holy angels. If anything proves that we are in an adulterous and sinful generation, it is the codification of infant murder. And we cannot be ashamed of Christ or of his words on this issue in our generation, or else Jesus says, I will be ashamed of you. Now, it might feel at times like we're doing nothing more than speaking to the wind. That's fine. At least you're speaking. So the most difficult part about preaching the gospel down on the streets of Minneapolis was when people ignored you. But at least someone's preaching. You know, beloved, speaking the Lord's testimony before the world will never be an exercise in vanity. (laughs) Wrong page. In fact, remember that God himself is doing that right here in Psalm 75, verses 4 through 5. What's God doing? He's speaking to the boastful, and he's calling them not to boast. He's speaking to the wicked, and he's telling them to stop being wicked. They may not listen, but God is still speaking, and we must follow God's example and do the same. So how do we respond to the evil in our world today? We continue to speak unashamedly the words and the truth of our God. Number two, we continue to praise and worship God without embarrassment. Without embarrassment. Psalm 75, verse 9. Praise, worship, and hope in God in light of the end. You see there in verse 9 and 10 that Asaph is considering the end of all things. What's going to happen at the end of time? Well, the horn of the wicked is going to be cut down, but the horn of the righteous will be lifted up. No matter how arrogant and prideful the godless horn in our own state rises up. No matter how much the arrogant and prideful horn of the godless in our own state rises up. We need to make sure we don't lose perspective of their end. Verse 10, all horns of the wicked will be cut off, but the horns of the righteous will be lifted up. In other words, God is going to cut down all the wicked, but the righteous will be lifted up forever. So praise him for that. Even when we are surrounded by wickedness, we can rest in the fact that the righteous will be exalted forever. We may not be exalted in this life. That's fine. We're going to be exalted when it counts. This is all vanity fair. This is all playground for for ungodly, unholy people who are just biding their time. This is where the devil is waging his war because he knows his time is short. But it's all going to come to an end. And what's going to matter whenever it comes to an end? What's going to matter is that you were among the righteous. You were among those who stood firm in the truth of Christ. You were among those who were not ashamed to stand firm in his truth. Jesus says, oh, you're going to be lifted up forever. Hold fast and endure. 
You're going to be hated by all for my name's sake, but it's the one who endures to the end who will be saved. Jesus says, so we praise and we worship God in the midst of this evil generation without embarrassment. Psalm 37, right? We don't fret because of the evildoers. We dwell in the land. We cultivate faithfulness. We delight ourselves in the Lord. He will give us the desires of our heart. We commit our way to the Lord. We trust in him and wait for him to act. That's how we live among an evil and adulterous generation. So that's number two. Number three, how do we respond? We put all of our hope in God. Verse 10, the horns of the righteous will be lifted up. God will make all things right one day and the wicked will not prevail. You know, Jesus Christ himself is proof of that reality, isn't he? He is our foretaste of the glorious victory of righteousness and the triumph over evil that is yet to come. The world poured out upon Christ its most vile, unjust expression of tyrannical wickedness, poured it out upon his head, and then gloated over him saying, a deadly thing is poured out upon him. He will not rise. We did it. And Jesus rose again from the dead on the third day. Evil believed it had triumphed over Christ. The very, I mean, think the very light of the sun stopped shining upon the earth, mourning the death of the God man. But when evil had exhausted itself, Jesus Christ, the mighty lion of the tribe of Judah, rose from the dead in victory. And that's our victory. His victory is our victory if we are in him. He conquered sin, he conquered death, he conquered hell, he triumphed over all the principalities and powers and rulers of this present darkness. God put them all to open shame when he triumphed over Christ through the cross and resurrection. When he triumphed through Christ. Beloved, that's, that victory is yours in Jesus Christ and he promises to give that to all who will trust in him alone to give it. So how do we respond? We respond by holding fast our hope in Christ. We fight the good fight of faith. We finish the course well. We keep the faith in this evil day. And we endure to the end. And Jesus gives us the promise of salvation. The horn of the righteous will be lifted up. So hold fast in faith, beloved, until the victory comes. Father, we do pray that you would give us grace to do that. Lord, it's hard. It's hard to maintain a tender heart towards those who are doing such evil in our day. Father, we thank you that you are merciful. And that even this sin of abortion, of murdering children, is not enough to keep someone from finding salvation through the lamb that was slain. Lord, I thank you. Lord, I thank you that even something so atrocious and vile does not keep you from pouring out upon someone the riches of your love. Father, fill us with a holy compassion to minister to women who make these decisions to minister to fathers who are complicit, to doctors who enact the procedure, to state senators and legislators, our uh, representatives, our legislative branch, our governor, judges. God, help us maintain a tender heart of compassion towards them. Such were some of us but we were washed and we were sanctified and we were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. May we never lose sight of what we were outside of you. And may we never lose hope for the world around us in light of the saving work you've accomplished on our behalf. Give us boldness, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
while we're uh, waiting on everyone to get settled and as we're coming to the table, I, uh, I think it's important to remember. Uh, this is a heavy Sunday. It's a day of mourning. It should be a day of mourning for us, but there's not a better time for us to come to the Lord's table and worship than now. We all should be troubled, we all should be grieved over what's happened in our state, but we are still called by Christ to bring those troubles, to bring those griefs and pour them out before him, even as we come here to this table. He is not untouched by our troubles. He's tender-hearted, he's compassionate, and he knows the pain and the grief. You know, as we come to this table, we're also reminded of the fact that redemption is not, is not beyond anyone who may have had an abortion in the past. Um, I know, uh, personally, I know many women who have had abortions in the past and whom the Lord has gloriously saved. And um, they mourn, they grieve over what they've done but they trust in the, in the richness of Christ's grace and the fullness of the satisfaction of his sacrifice on their behalf. God saves murderers. Yeah. You know that. You see the Apostle Paul in that list. There's grace for any and all who will come and have it. But there is a cup waiting for those who will not. One of the greatest encouragements that we can take away from the table today is that God's grace is enough for us as we continue to minister for his sake in this state. It's not too late. Let's keep preaching and being faithful to declare this message to those who need to hear it.